session, so please. All right. Today's topic will be, is the devil in charge of hell? <laughs> I think it's an interesting topic, don't you think so? <laughs> okay, let's bow our heads first for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the songs that we have sung. We pray, Lord, that you will accept our worship now as we study your word and your word which comes from you. Father, may you open our hearts and our minds May you nourish our intellect. May we be able to have the wisdom to understand these things. And may you be caught to as he presents it. May your spirit be with him to give him eloquence and give me too, our Father, clarity of mind and each one of us here, that we may be able to digest and absorb everything that is being said from your word. So we pray for your spirit to be upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, there is a lot of um, thoughts of in, in, in Christendom that uh, the way to convert a person may be to scare them with hell, that they will want heaven. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about uh, uh, this sentiment, this thought, <clears throat> this common thought that actually somehow Satan is given a job by God, obviously, to be in charge of hell, <laughs> to, to kind of torture people um, forever and ever. And I grew up myself as a Taoist Buddhist. And when I was young, like five, six years old, and 10 years old, uh, I, was, I grew up in Malaysia, in, in, in Ipoh, actually. And my father... Uh, has connections in Singapore. So he'd bring us to a uh, holiday uh, in Singapore. And we would visit Hopa Villa. And Hopa Villa has a section on hell. <laughs> and it actually frightened the hell out of me. <laughs> so the idea of hell is quite common, right? So it actually gives a bad picture of God. Because when I watch atheists debating with Christian, the atheists would say, look at hell, your God tortures people forever. What kind of a God is that? You know? So today we're going to talk about hell. Okay? And, and we're going <laughs> to hopefully not cause indigestion, but <laughs> give you some relief. <laughs> okay, so let's get into the, <laughs> the slides. Okay, so is the devil really in charge of hell? Okay, and on the left is Hopa Villa, Singapore. Scary. But on the right is Dante, Italy, right? Uh, and and it equally frightening. <laughs> so uh, we need to ask the question and really figure out what is this? How can God allow this to begin with? Okay, all right. So. The question I, we want to ask is, does God really keep the devil as the chief in charge of hell, measuring out the punishment of the lost? Now, so what we think about hell affects what we think about God, his character for allowing this, or putting Satan in charge, right? So, and, and nearly the entire world holds a very wicked view of hell. And we owe it to ourselves and to God to know what the Bible really says about it. Okay? All right. Now, so, could a loving God burn people for all eternity? That's the subject tonight. Now, the first question is, how many lost souls are being punished in hell today? Today, right? The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Okay, this is 2 Peter 2.9. Right, so it says, the Lord knows how to deliver the, the godly out of temptation and to reserve. Now, when, when we reserve some seats at a, at a, at a, at a concert, you know, that will happen in a 10 days time, it's to happen in 10 days' time, it's reserved. And to reserve the unjust, the wicked, under punishment for the day of judgment. 
So the day of judgment is not even here yet, right? It's in the future. It's reserved, all right? All right, so what's the answer to that question? There is not one single soul in hell fire today. The Bible says that God reserves or holds back the wicked until the day of judgment to be punished. Okay, so I think that's clear. Let's get, as we build up this picture with more and more verses so that, you know, uh, one uh, verse supports the other, okay? All right, so when will, then the next question, when will the lost be cast into hellfire? If they are reserved, all right? So it will be at the end of this age, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. So it's at the end of this age. All right, now what else does John 12 say? The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So obviously hell must occur after judgment. So if judgment is in the last day and it, at, at the end of this age, right? So there's no hellfire today, all right? So when, when is that? So what's the answer in summary? The lost will be cast into hellfire at the great judgment, at the end of the world, not when they die. God will not punish a person in fire until his or her case was tried and decided in court at the end of the world. Does it make sense that God would burn a murderer who died 5,000 years ago, 5,000 years longer than a murderer who dies today and deserves the same punishment for the same sin? Okay, so it's first illogical. And so it is at the great judgment at the end of the world. Because you can only be punished if you are to be punished after judgment. Right? Third question, where are the unsafe who have already died? Where are they? If the judgment is later and hellfire is much later, where are the unsafe who have already died? The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So there are two resurrections, all right? But from this verse alone, it sounds as if the resurrection to life and the resurrection to condemnation, the one and two, seems to occur at the same time. But is it true? Do they really occur at the same time? In fact, the Bible will tell you in the next slide, they occur at two different times. Actually, a thousand years apart. A thousand years. All right? All right. Now, let's read Job. That the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction, yet shall he be brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. So, whoever you may be, right, you die first, you remain in the tomb until the resurrection. Uh, if you're righteous, to the resurrection of life, number one. And if you are wicked, to the resurrection of condemnation, number two. But these resurrections are a thousand years apart. All right, let's look at the next slide. All right, here are the two separate resurrections. The first resurrection of the righteous is when Christ returns. Okay, and the second resurrection of the wicked after the millennium. How do we know that? A is that first resurrection, the righteous. B, the resurrection a thousand years later of the wicked. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 tells us this is when Christ returns. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay, so the dead in Christ, the righteous will rise first. And then when do the wicked then get uh, resurrected? It is in B and Revelations 20, all right? This is much, much later in verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Okay, a thousand years. It says not any old thousand years. It's the thousand years. 
That's the millennium. Okay, mm. verse 13. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each according to his works. So that is the, B is the resurrection of the wicked. A thousand years later, after the millennium. Okay, so I hope that's clear. So one and two, right? Okay. Now here's a chart to make it simple. Right? Uh, uh, don't focus on everything. <laughs> <laughs> Try to focus on one thing at a time. And I'm giving you a clue. There are numbers there, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So let's focus on number one. Now, number one is that green arrow. And that's A, right? And then B is the resurrection of the wicked after the millennium can you see that the, the thousand years all right so a and b is separated are separated by a thousand years now a is the resurrection of the righteous okay when christ returns and b is the resurrection of the wicked after a thousand years so at the moment all that's all you need to know is those two facts and we will move forward okay all right so so that's a and b again the previous slide. Now, what happens at B? Okay, right? after the millennium. Now, let's read number four. Uh, the question number four. The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Okay. So the second death, which is reserved for the wicked, will happen after the thousand years. And you can see that picture of fire there. Hmm? Okay. And that is called the second death. Now, we'll talk about what the second death really means. Okay. But that is the second death. All right? They're resurrected and they face a second death. Now, let's read Job 2130. That the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction, yet shall he be brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. So the wicked dies, remains in the tomb, gets resurrected at B, and then faces something called a second death. All right? Okay. Now, this thing about the second death is talked about quite extensively and particularly well thought talked about by Oscar Kalman. He's a noted Lutheran theologian, uh, the same kind of uh, 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 renown as Karl Barth and all that. All right? Now, he talks about the second death, but first he refers to Revelations 20, 14, 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not writ whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, this is the second death, Revelation 20. Now, Revelation 27, and when the thousand years are expired. Okay, so it refers to after the thousand years. That's the second death. Okay, now, Oscar Kalman's own words to describe this second death. Using different words, the author of the Johannine Apocalypse also regards death as the last enemy when he described how at the end death will be cast into the lake of fire because it is God's enemy. It separates us from God who is life and the creator of all life. Okay, so it, is, it says at the end. Uh, that's the crucial part. At the end of time. Right? After the thousand years. Even death will be gone. Yes. This end of death. Now, the second death actually is the end of death. There's, there's no more death after that. Hmm. That's the good news. So we get back to this picture. Right? The A and the B. All right. Let's uh, follow the, the numbers. All right. Number one. Number one is when Christ returns. And 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 54 tells us that at, when Christ returns at the point of A, the righteous dead are resurrected. Now, let's read that quickly. All right? Okay, let's all turn to 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll start reading from verses 50 onwards. 
1 Corinthians 15, 15. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Okay, so at the last trump, right, the uh, transformation to the glorified body, that's when Christ returns. And more on that, A, is number two, First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. All right? yes. It also not just only deals with the dead, the, the righteous dead being resurrected, but it also deals with the righteous living being caught up with the righteous dead. Okay, so let's read. First Thessalonians 4, 13, I read. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So when Christ returns, both the righteous dead and the righteous living are brought up to be with the Lord forever. And you can see that uh, situation, that seed in number three, which we have also just read because it is in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. 4.17 tells you, that we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Up there. Not during the thousand years, because uh, when, when Christ, after Christ returns, there is the millennium. So that thousand years is up. The righteous are up in heaven. All right, let's read to be sure. Revelations 26, right? The purple highlighted part, right? Revelations 26. Yes, they shall say that we shall reign with him 1,000 years. So are you there now? Revelation 26, I read. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. First resurrection. Resurrection A, right? On such, the second death hath no power. Right. So the second death has no power over these who have been resurrected here. Yes. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him 1,000 years. All right. So that 1,000 years is again a millennium. They are up there. Okay. Now, what happens to the wicked when at the point of the green arrow? When Christ returns, what happens to the wicked? Now, that's number four. All right, let's read Matthew 24, 27, 39. What, the question now is, what happens to the wicked when Christ returns? The living wicked. Okay, 27, verse 20, Matthew 24, 27 says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, so situation is the coming of the Son of Man, right? All right, verse 39. No, and, 
Yeah, okay, 39. Uh, so this is seen, the coming of the Son of Man, right? And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So this is the coming of the Son of Man. And let's read verse 37 as well. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Ah, as in the days of Noah. Now what happens in the days of Noah? There were the ones who went into the ark and lived, and the rest died in the flood. So as in the sons of Noah, there only be two groups. The ones that are righteous, and they went into the ark. They lived. The ones that were wicked stayed outside, and they drowned. So as in the sons of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. There will be two groups, and the wicked who remain wicked, right? they all die. They perish. All right. Now we see the same picture in Luke 21. Okay, let's all turn to Luke 21 and look at verse 27. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And then verse 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. All right, some will stand before the Son of Man. But let's pray that we should be counted worthy to escape. Right? As in the time of Noah, that we should escape alive. And this escape doesn't mean rapture. Yeah. Because it talks about the time of the end when Christ returns. Right? So it collaborates, Luke collaborates with Matthew. Now let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 to 3. For you yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. So if we aren't prepared for the coming of Christ, right, when, and think it's all peace and safety, peace and safety, right, we may not, we shall not escape, shall not escape, shall not escape that moment, shall not escape as in the times of Noah, but if we were prepared, we should escape. Now, Revelations 19, 21. Now, let, let me under, uh, explain Revelations 19, 21. Okay? Now, Revelations 19, 21 <clears throat> has everything to do with the time of the end. All right? It's Revelations 19, 21 uh, talks about the time of the end when Jesus returns on a horse as king. All right? Now, let's read Revelations 19, 21 first, and then, sorry, 19, the last verse, 21. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with the flesh. Okay, now what, what happens is a, a cataclysmic, cataclysmic scene when Jesus returns. Let's read 18 to give us a feel for uh, how 21 occurs, right? Verse 18, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and born, both small and great. Okay, so there is a, 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 a devouring of flesh, all flesh. To the point that it's not just the kings and the, the great men and the, and, and the horses. It's both men, small and great. And then verse 21 says, and the remnant. In other words, anyone who is left, residue, remnant, who is left, they were slain with the sword. And this remnant is not the righteous remnant. Okay, yeah. It's talking about the wicked who were not eaten up, you know, yeah. by all those things, and now there's still that remnant left, they will be destroyed. This Everything, day. everyone, the residue, the remnant will be destroyed. So that scene, when Jesus returns, tells us that no one lives. And, and to imagine seven last plagues, right? 
Uh, and, and, and to think that people will live through that. Okay, so. And to think that the, the millennium will not be a dead earth, right? Right. Now, now, the millennium, because of this number four, where everything is destroyed, where life is, is, is gone, no, no signs of life left, the millennium will be a dead earth. Mm. Okay? Now, that it is the dead earth is also collaborated by Revelations 25, we, where we read, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Right? The dead were dead at number four. And for a thousand years, the thousand years, the rest of the dead live not again. So it was after the thousand years in B that the wicked were resurrected. Okay? So this is the picture. That, uh, 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 this is the frame on which we will proceed with this talk. Okay? All right. Now, let's, Oscar Kalman, th th this uh, noted theologian, this is how he describes uh, death, final death, the second death. All right? Now, what does it, how does it occur and where is it referred to? Let's read Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Okay, now, both God can destroy both, not one, both soul and body. Uh, most of like the Taoists, the Buddhists, you know, Hopa Villa, they imagine that God can only, will only destroy the body. But not a soul. The soul can be punished forever and burned forever and not die. But here in Matthew 28, but rather fear God who is able to destroy both. Right, now, how does Oscar Kalman comment on this? Please read. Fear not them that kill the body but cannot kill the soul. It might seem to presuppose the view that the soul has no need of the body but the context of the passage shows that this is not the case. Jesus does not continue, be afraid of him who kills the soul only. That's like God killing the soul only. Rather, fear him who can slay both soul and body in Gehenna. That is, fear God, who is able to give completely to death, to wit, when he does not resurrect you to life. So what is death? Second death is when he will not resurrect you to life. Complete annihilation. Non-existent. That is the second death. All right. Number five, question. What is the end result of sin? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. God gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, the question at the bottom, what is the reward of the safe? The resurrection, right? So the Bible says when he comes, Christ comes, he brings, he brings his reward and his reward is the resurrection. And we see that very clearly in Romans 6, 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Yeah? And then Philippians 3, 12 emphasizes that even more. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable, conformable unto his death. So if we share his death, our reward, is his resurrection or being to be resurrected like him when he resurrects us right not immediately but when he resurrects us and that is when he comes that green arrow remember okay so answer to what is the end result of sin the wages for sin is death not everlasting life in hell fire the wicked perish or receive death the righteous are the ones who receive eternal or everlasting life. But when? At the resurrection. Okay? So, 
we have read. Uh, let's read that 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 uh, John 5, 28, 29, right? The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Okay, now. A lot of, uh, as we talk to people, one of the concerns is this, but I'm a Christian already. I am tasting eternal death. I mean, eternal life, okay? I'm already on my journey to eternal life. I'm, I, I have that life in spiritually. So you mean when I die, I, I then cease to exist until the resurrection? I mean, if I die, if my father, who, who my, my great grandfather, who accepted Christ a thousand years ago, and he died a thousand years ago, you mean he's nowhere? He's dead and in the tomb and knows nothing? But Oscar Kalman describes this uh, lapse of time, death, as a retreat to, to comfort us that we die in God. All right? Uh, here is how he puts it. But here, it is a question only of a retreat, all right? Not of a final transformation of the body, of death, into a resurrection body. Even those who Jesus raised up in his lifetime will die again, for they did not receive a resurrection body. The transformation of the fleshly body into a spiritual body does not take place till the end. So it seems so difficult for people to accept a, a retreat, a temporary retreat like suspense suspended life okay? okay all right so this is that picture so one dies into the two they die into god but they are suspended a retreat all right. so what will happen to the wicked in hellfire the wicked die the second death in hellfire if the wicked live forever being tortured in hell they will be immortal but this is impossible because the Bible says God alone has immortality. When Adam and Eve were driven from the Garden of Eden, an angel was posted to guard the tree of life so that sinners would not eat of that tree and live forever. The teaching that sinners are immortal in hell originated with Satan and is completely untrue. God prevented this when sin entered this earth by guarding the tree of life. Okay, now let, I think the next slide shows Adam and Eve. There, there, there it is. Okay, so after Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't want them to be immortal. In other words, if Adam and Eve were uh, 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 prevented from eating of the tree of life, they would die. All right, so what happened then was in Genesis 3.24, Angels with flaming swords were, 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 were put to keep Adam and Eve away from the tree of life. That if they ate, they will live forever. Right? So, because Adam and Eve left the garden, didn't have access to the tree of life, and we don't have access to the tree of life now, can we be immortal? We will be like Adam and Eve. We will die. Right? So, in Genesis 3.22, we read those words in full. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Okay, so we are not immortal. And only God is immortal. Okay, and to say that, to think that we are immortal, that something about us never ever dies, is to insist that we are like God and immortal. So number seven, question. When and how will hellfire be started, be kindled? So it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will cast them into the furnace of fire. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Okay, let's continue the story. After the thousand years, what happens? At B, the wicked were resurrected. And the Bible says, after the thousand years, Satan is loosed from his prison, from the chains, right? He was locked up, so to speak, with a chain, a big chain. 
for a thousand years. And that was during the millennium. But figuratively, what happened is that the whole earth was dead. He had no one to tempt. So it's like figuratively he was locked up. He had nothing to do. So after a thousand years, the wicked were resurrected. And Satan was loosed. And then he began to tempt the wicked to attack the new Jerusalem, which by that time had come down to the earth after the millennium. All right, so this is, so the question is, when and how will hell, hellfire be kindled? That's when hellfire is kindled, after the millennium, when they attack the new Jerusalem. So the answer. The Bible says that God will kindle hellfire. After the holy city comes down out of heaven, the wicked will attempt to capture it. At that time, God will rain down fire from heaven upon the earth, and it will devour the wicked. This fire is Bible hellfire. So that hellfire first protects the city and the people, the righteous, because they are in it, and it destroys the wicked. Okay, so that's the scenario. So, question now, how big and how <laughs> hot will hellfire be? Now, imagine if the wicked by that time are by the billions. Mm. And they include the most wicked people on earth. Right? Like Hitler, uh, I know, Mugabe. Uh, like Nero. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow, like amazing gathering. And Satan is amongst them. So, oh, this hellfire better be good, right? <laughs> All right. So let's find out how hard it will be. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So this is like a cleansing fire. Right? The, the, the sinners who did not repent even though they had a chance. That's the wicked. They do not repent. And after they're resurrected, what happens? They do the same old wicked thing. So when Jesus came and they all died, and Jesus had pre-judged them before he, come, he came, it shows that after a thousand years, after they were resurrected, they did the wicked thing again. It showed that Jesus pre-judgment when he came, was right. And so the execution of the judgment is valid. Right? So this is a, a rather wise um, scene, uh, events that proves that the wicked, judge wicked before the thousand years, do wickedly again. Uh, the judgment of Christ was valid. So how big and how hot will hellfire be? Hellfire will be just as big as this earth because it will be the earth on fire. This fire will be so hot as to melt the earth and burn up all the works that are in it. The atmospheric heavens will explode and pass away with a great noise. So it is a cleansing fire. All right. Now, how long will the wicked suffer in the fire? Is it forever? Let's see what the Bible says. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. He, God, Christ, will reward each according to his work. That servant who knew his master's will and did not do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed Things deserving of stripes will be beaten with few. So there are levels of uh, punishment, I suppose we'll say that. Levels of um, trauma. Uh, but it is each according to his works. Okay? But not forever. And we will see how it's not forever. So the answer, 
how long will wicked suffer in the fire? The Bible does not tell us how long the wicked will be punished before receiving death in the fire. God does specifically state, however, that all will be punished according to their works. This means some will receive longer punishment than others based upon their works. Okay, so there will be punishment of different levels according to the mercy of God. Okay. How big and how hot will hellfire be? Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. It shall not be a coal to be warmed by, nor a fire to sit before. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So, this, this, this phrase here, not be a coal to be warm, nor a fire to sit before. It's a very um, cold climate <laughs> saying, right? But what it means is that it will burn out. It's not a fire forever. It would burn out until you can't warm yourself with that. And it shall be a stubble. Now, stubble in that picture is when the fire goes through this field, what is left is little uh, bunches of ashes. That's stubble. That's it. Right? It's a cleansing fire. It's a renewing fire because the, the, the earth will be made new. Okay. So it's a fire that burns until there's no more to burn. Yeah. And the ashes can't even burn anymore. Yeah. And we'll see more of that, right? So... Now, let's read. How long again, how big and how hot will hellfire be? Yes, the Bible specifically teaches that hellfire will go out. For there will not be left a coal to be warmed by, nor a fire to sit before. The Bible also says that in God's new kingdom, all former things will have passed away. Hell, being one of the former things, is included. So we have God's promises, promise that it will be abolished if God tortured his enemies in a fiery horror chamber throughout eternity. He would be more vicious and heartless than men have ever been in the worst of war atrocities. An eternal hell of torment will be hell for God also, who loves even the vilest sinner. So it would be agonizing for God to punish people forever and ever. So God is wise. God is merciful. There is punishment, but it is measured. Right? So this is a wonderful, the wonderful design of God. So what will be left when fire goes out? Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. And all the proud, proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day will which is coming shall burn them up that will leave them neither root nor branch. You shall trample the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. So ashes under the soles of your feet. In other words, you can walk through them and not be burned. That's how, what happens when the fire goes out. But the whole purpose of the fire is to cleanse the world of sin. It is when people hang on to their sins and do wickedly. That's because they don't let go of their sins. That's why the fire, which is to destroy sin, also destroys the ones who hang on to sin. Okay? So what will be left when the fire goes out? Notice the verse does not say the wicked will burn like asbestos, as many today believe but rather like stubble, which will be burned up. The little word up denotes completion. Nothing but ashes will be left when the fire goes out. In Psalms 37, 10 and 20, the Bible says, the wicked will go up in smoke and be completely destroyed. So the fire destroys sin and the wicked who hang on to their sins. Will the wicked enter hell in bodily form and be destroyed, both soul and body? It is 
more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast in hell. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The soul who sins shall die. Okay, so Oscar Common said, well, there's no distinction between body and soul. They both are destroyed. And God is capable of destroying not just the body, right? Capable of destroying both body and soul. That is the second death. Hmm. All right. Oscar Common also elaborates on what the living soul is. All right. He's trying to destroy the idea that the living soul is a spiritual uh, thing which cannot die. Right. Now, he's going to tell us that the body and soul are together as one indivisible. Right. This is how he expresses himself. It is important to see how different the New Testament anthropology is from that of the Greeks. Body and soul are both originally good insofar as they are created by God. They are both bad insofar as the deadly power of the flesh has hold on them. Both can and must be set free from the quickening power of the Holy Spirit. All right, so man is body and soul or the breath of life, okay? And I've heard um, Dr. Lim mentions the breath of life, breath of life. So this is who we are, body and breath of life, all right? Or body and soul, okay? Both are originally good. And with sin, both are bad. Now, Oscar Kalman is trying to destroy the Greek philosophy. Now, Greek is pagan, remember. And Greek philosophy, like Taoism, it says this. Oh, that's the body. And the soul is from paradise. And the soul comes from paradise and merges with the body. The body is bad. The soul is from paradise, good. And so... This is human being. This is a man, right? So in death, in Greek philosophy, oh, the body goes back to dust and the soul returns to heaven or paradise. So the, the soul never dies. But this is not how Oscar Kalman sees it. He sees it at both as one. So they're either bad or good. All right? Either it is resurrected, even better, Right, uh, uh, what he calls the uh, what we call uh, resurrected with uh, uh, incorruptible body, right? Or it dies completely in hellfire. Right? This is how he explained it. Will the wicked enter hell in bodily form and be destroyed both soul and body? Yes. Real living people enter hell in bodily form and are destroyed both soul and body. The fire from God out of heaven will fall upon real people and block them out of existence. Well, there you are. Complete destruction, annihilation, second death. Will the devil be in charge of hellfire? <laughs> The okay. devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Himself was cast into the lake of fire. I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. You shall be no more forever. Forever and ever. Okay. Will the devil be in charge of hellfire? Absolutely not. The devil will be himself cast into the fire. And it will turn him into ashes. Just like the rest of the wicked. But the, I think the punishment, as we've just read, measured out to the devil may be a great deal more. Okay? So what is God's real purpose of hellfire? What's the objective? Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. The enemies of the Lord shall vanish into smoke. They shall vanish away. So what's the purpose? Wickedness, sin are destroyed. 
so that it will not infect the new heavens and the new earth. Right? So this is to get rid of something that troubled us and troubled heaven. Now remember, it was a Lucifer who broke the sabbatismos in heaven. He wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to ascend. His ambition was to ascend to the sides of the north, of the congregation where they worship God. So it is to, to destroy and make sure that sin will never rise again. So what's the answer? God's purpose is that hell will destroy the devil, all sin and the unsafe to make the world safe for eternity. Any vestige of sin left on this planet will be a deadly virus forever threatening the universe. It is God's plan to blot out sin from existence for all time, once and for all. So that was the purpose of that hellfire after the millennium. Okay. So isn't the act of destroying the unsaved foreign to God's nature, not like God at all? As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your wicked ways, from your evil ways. For why should you die? The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. The Lord will rise up that he may do his work, his awesome work, and bring to pass his act. His unusual act. His unusual act. Right? In his wisdom and with his mercy, he can do it in <coughs> that loving, merciful way, which is unusual to us. But I think I can trust him very much to do it the way it is just. Isn't the act of destroying the unsafe foreign to God's nature? Of course it is. Yes, the work of God has always been to save rather than to destroy. The work of destroying the wicked in hellfire is so foreign to God's nature that the Bible calls it his unusual act. God's great heart will ache at the destruction of the wicked. Oh, how diligently he works to save every soul. But if one spurns his love and clings to sin, God will have no choice but to destroy the unrepentant sinner when he rids the universe of the horrible, malignant growth called sin in the fires of the last day. Yes, I can, I can feel the agony of God in carrying out destruction when he has spent so much to save the life of his son. So the agony would be indescribable. Mm -hmm. and, and we who are humans can even feel it, but to think of how God would feel in destroying those who he, he, have, he has uh, spilled his own blood to save. So what are God's post-hell plans for the earth and his people? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise a second time. Isaiah says, I will create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell in them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. Okay. Where's the next slide? After hellfire goes out, God will create a new earth and restore it to his people with all the beauties and glories of Eden before sin entered. Pain, death, tragedy, woe, tears, sickness, disappointment, sorrow, and all sin will be banished forever. 
sin will not rise again. God promises that sin will never rise again. His people will be filled with perfect peace, love, joy, and contentment. Their lives of complete happiness will be far more glorious and thrilling than mere words could ever describe. The real tragedy of hell is in missing heaven. A person who chooses not to enter this magnificent kingdom has made the saddest choice of a lifetime. This is such good news. It shows the wisdom of God and how he has plans to do all these things so perfectly. So getting back to the chart. <clears throat> in Revelation 29, you will read that Satan and the wicked attack, try to attack the new Jerusalem. And that's when fire from heaven right, destroys the wicked in the attempt to take over the new Jerusalem. So that is called the second death. And that is when sin is completely destroyed. De even death is no more. So there is complete 100% what life ought to be hmm. in the new heavens and the new earth. So getting back to one of the slides last night, Jesus or the third temple. The point I would make last night was the whole purpose of the temple on earth mm. and in heaven is to do away with sin, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is to judge the wickedness of sin. So when sin is no more in the new heavens and new Jerusalem, there is no need for a temple. Mm. And God and the Lamb, Jesus, is the temple. That's what we hear in Revelation 21, 22. And this is after the millennium. And I see. After the cleansing of the earth, after the new heavens and the new earth. And I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Okay. A perfect ending. Where mm -hmm. our temple is the Christ whom we have known on earth. Right? who has come into our life so that even if I die now as a Christian, I die into God. I die into, um, I die so that there is nothing that can threaten my uh, relationship with him because I die into God. It's a retreat, a temporary retreat. This is the wisdom of God. So, first question, the very first question we ask, is the devil really in charge of hell? I think the answer in summary is when there's no more sin and no more hell, hence there is no more temple, except Jesus has done his work, mm. has cleansed the earth, has restored his true people. And he, and he lives with them. And the Bible goes on to describe this. There's no shadow. Can you imagine that we, when we are in new heavens and new earth, we have restored and there is a certain amount of light even emitting from our own incorruptible bodies. And if you imagine yourself to be a kind of a light bulb, <laughs> there's no shadow. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's no shadow of turning. Isn't it amazing? And therefore, there's no need for uh, uh, a ministry, a temple as such. Mm. And God and the Lamb is the temple thereof. Right. Hallelujah. It's Hallelujah. Such a, such a great plan of salvation. Well, it's I, I so want to see if they think it's a great plan. <laughs> Is it indigestion or delight <laughs> or relief? <laughs> okay, you can unmute yourself and express your thoughts and your delight or your whatever. Okay, I see a lot of unmute. So I see a lot of smiles. That's good. <laughs> More <laughs> indigestion. <laughs> More indigestion? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Some new okay, people. Like people. Well, ending. Well, good ending. <laughs> ending. Good ending. <laughs> 
Chris, what did you say? More indigestion? <laughs> See, it take it takes so much time for a, a man who loved the Lord. Uh, he take the time for a man to soak time to learn to have intimacy with God, uh, so that he know God reveal so many things to him to bless so many people. You okay? You okay? What I say? Yes. You see, for our brother here, by God divine appointment. You see, we are not in great in number. But Lord, the Lord, you see, like Paul in the book of uh, Acts, he said that uh, set aside, set aside who? I still remember, set aside Silas or who? Huh? Keep that man that the Lord has sanctified for together with me uh, to go to the Turkey, Asia Minor for three times. So this is our brother here, uh, husband and wife. He was selected by God. I, I'm not praising him. But this is, this is the way that uh, he, out of his heart, he spoke from the truth. And the truth made us free. You see, we don't bother. We only have 38 people here. Only. I was so blessed. Even though I lie down in the hospital, I'm so blessed. Praise the Lord. You see, and I'm going to go further, extra one more mile again. And together, the, those who are, are stubborn, stiff neck arguing. I like these people. I will call them back and one by one and let the word of God uh, strip them. Strip them in their mouth. Strip them in their body so that they know before we appear in the front of God. Thank you my dear brother Koktu. Uh, we can do together for the kingdom. We are the, we are the bulk that have no shadow. <laughs> Yes. Let your light so shine before men that they may yes. see your good works and glorify yes. your Father in heaven. Yes. yes. You see, many people can rebel me of the ministry, but I just thank the Lord. When the Lord put you there, we just work. If the Lord put you there, you just work. Work for the Lord. Uh, people, people may rebel you, give you all kinds of name. Praise the Lord. You see, Jesus has gone through also. Huh? That now I only understand if people slap you on the right cheek, let him slip, slap on the left cheek also. <laughs> right, brother, talk to me. <laughs> but it's hard to do, but we have to do it. After, after, after I'm, I'm alone in this room, that's why I can say whatever I want to say. And I'm speaking to the, to the friend and also to to brothers and sisters far away. Even though I am in this room, I still can conduct to arrange for the glory of the Lord. Because the, the truth that you have spoken is the truth. And make people laugh. You see, my dear Uncle Victor Lee, you can see his <laughs> teeth also. Ha, I want to see your teeth. When you see, that is the truth. And our, our sister Kathy Young here and some other people. You have any question you can ask. <laughs> Grab hold of this husband and wife and ask. Okay? I leave it yeah. to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dato. All right. Thank you. you get well quickly. quickly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the exhortation. And um, I see SB also unmuted. Anyone like to speak? I have, uh, this is my first time uh, uh, hearing, you know, how, I mean, uh, God's punishment uh, to this detail. And uh, I'm glad to know that God is not delightful in punishing people oh. forever and ever <laughs> in the, you know, fiery furnace. But it is, you know, that he 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 is merciful and uh, yet yet he is just i mean he is just to all mankind he does a perfect work yeah, yeah. praise the lord yes it shows his character isn't it is it is now as we studied what we had studied today it's consistent with the loving character of god yeah it, it makes God, sense. 
love. God is love itself, you know. And he's merciful, he's he's faithful, and um, his plans are good, good for everyone, you know. If you obey, you will you he he has plans to prosper you if you obey and trust. But if you go contrary contrary to him, you face the consequences. Yeah. So I I I, I uh, now see how the thing will unfold to the end, and uh, it gives us great hope. You know, great hope for the living. You know, that we don't have this fear, <laughs> fear of un uncertainty, unknown, and where will we be? You know, how it will happen. Now we know how it's going to be. How the end will come. Yes. Yeah. It makes us love God even more instead of trying to love Him because we are fearful of hell, right? <laughs> yeah. We are, we are fearful of how the, you know, the, the pain and the suffering that we will have to face at the end, you know, how the thing. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to fear because if we are on God's side and we are, you know, Trusting and believing in him and obeying him, we have no fear. We he will we know that we are assured of his uh, uh, amazing grace and his his redemption plan, and he will be there. We we know our our glorious ending, you know, mm. and and uh, we will have the faith of holding on. You know, no matter what circumstances we face, we will hold on and. Keep fighting and stand for it. what is what is our cause, you know, to the end. Yes, amen. We will hang on. That's so important concept. And that concept came when in the story where Jacob wrestled with God. I don't know if you know the story, but if you don't, one day I'll I want to I want to I want to speak it. I want to tell it. Because yeah, yeah Jacob went. He was wrestling and he thought he was an enemy. And this is just a short clip of it, right? And when he discovered it was Christ, he hung on. And, and at that point, his hip was broken by Christ, you know, and Christ wanted to go away. But when he recognized it was Christ, he hung on and said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Yeah. <laughs> not his new name. His new name was Israel. <laughs> Not Jacob. Okay, I see a lot of you waiting there with your hands up and um, mute, unmuted and muted already. All right, Kin Seng, I think you are very um, ready. Can you go ahead, please, Kin Seng Ku? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm Ellen. Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, actually, uh, just, uh, just now you explain about uh, uh, Kokto and uh, Brother Kokto, you been explain about hell uh, is not. Uh, 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 is non-existent yet until the, the day of judgment. All right, yeah. and um, but uh, you know, in the Bible, I remember one story about uh, Lazarus. You know, mm. and the rich man and the Lazarus, and the the rich man went to hell, and uh, he experienced uh, the the pains of hell. And you know, I, I don't know. I'm not very well versed uh, with the Bible, you know, but I remember so. The, the depiction is that this man, uh, the rich man, uh, went into physical hell, you know. So, so it is sort of a, a contradiction to what uh, you're saying that hell only, you know, burning fire in order comes yeah. only in the day of judgment. Right. Okay. But uh, apparently, uh, uh, let, let, this Bible text, uh, yeah. Let's just yeah. Uh, put Alan's uh, uh, question in perspective, okay? The story. Mm -hmm was there was a rich man and a poor man, Lazarus. Mm -hmm. and, and the rich man couldn't care about uh, Lazarus, the poor man. And then Jesus told uh, the story uh, that uh, after they died, uh, this rich man was in this burning place. <laughs> and then Lazarus was in uh, the good place on Abraham's bosom. And they can hold a conversation between Lazarus and uh, the rich man. The rich man was burning hot, uncomfortable, traumatized, and he begged Lazarus to help him. 
give him a drop of water, just one drop, and it will <laughs> quench his thirst. Right? Yeah. And, and, and then uh, it, it didn't say whether Lazarus did it or not, but the rich man would then beg, please send someone uh, to tell my brothers so that they don't ever come into this place. All right? So there's this picture of heaven and hell, but so close that they can talk to each other. All right, so let's uh, look at the context, uh, the verses which describe this and see what it means. Yes, let's all turn to Luke 16. This is where the passage is. And most people will look at Luke 16 and begin in the story where it starts at verse 19. But really, Jesus has been talking for quite a while and so to study the context of what happened, we had to go to verse 14. And so I hope you're all at your Bibles, Luke 16, verse 14, I read. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. So what were the Pharisees like? We are told they were covetous, right? And because they were covetous and they derided Jesus, Jesus said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourself before men. Oh, they want to be justified before, justified before men. But God knoweth your heart, so you're not just before God. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. So what was it? They were covetous. They wanted wealth and comfort. And they did not care about Lazarus. Or the, the weak, or the poor, and the suffering. Mm -hmm. Verse 16, the law and the prophets, Jesus continued, were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband, committeth adultery. There was a certain rich man, now the story begins, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So the setting is uh, that they can talk between hell and heaven. If we believe that is the scene. Now, we know <laughs> that from today's uh, material, 
there is no such thing as hell to begin with. Okay, now, so and even if there was something like hell, can they talk with each other? Can one in heaven enjoy heaven if hell is just next door? No. So the sin is what they call an allegory. Imaginary. An what? Is it imaginary? Yeah. And, well, it's a setting that's imaginary. But it's so imaginary that it's not real. For example, there is an allegory in the book of Judges where the trees are talking to the brambles. The trees don't talk. Right? But the setting is to tell a story. So this thing where heaven and hell are so close is to tell a setting. There is a good place and there's a bad place. And it's so sharp contrast between two persons who are talking to each other. Now, a drop of water will not quench the burning, but mm -hmm. it's used to emphasize the different mm. places. Okay? Mm. No. Yeah. Yeah. And more, yeah. than that, more than that, the, 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 the request at the end, send, send someone to tell my brothers, get Lazarus, was it? Yes, get yeah. Lazarus get, to, uh, to go and tell, go back. go back and tell my brothers who are still alive, um, let them <laughs> believe so that they will not have to come to this place of torment. Yeah. So, um, first of all, if you have died, you can't go back <laughs> and tell anybody. So the whole <laughs> event is to tell about how the Pharisees were covetous. Okay. They were in a bad place. Okay. So actually, in short, uh, uh, Brother Cocteau, you can also say that it's something like a parable, yeah. which uh, Jesus always <laughs> say, you know. Jesus goes around and uh, talks in parables uh, yep. to the to the people. So it is will be something like a parable, or you may call it an allegory. Yeah. Now a parable <laughs> has has a lot of reality. Yeah. Right. A parable mm -hmm. is like oh, so, yeah. I mean, you you uh, it talks about, for example, the parable of the fig tree. If you don't bear fruit, we'll cut it down. Right. There's a lot of reality there. But allegory has less reality and more imagination. Okay. Oh, more fiction, huh? Okay. Ah, okay. Okay, okay. I get it. Mm. So you can see that at the end of this story, just in a little while later, there was really a Lazarus, a man called Lazarus, a friend of Jesus who died. And he died much longer than anybody else has ever died before he was resurrected. I mean, mm. there were some resurrections in the Bible and you can know some of it in the Old Testament as well. Like Elijah rose someone, uh, the widow's uh, child, and then Elisha also. And then Jesus also rose, what, the wi widow's son. And then he, he, he resurrected also Jairus' daughter, but they were dead for a little while. And not many knew that they were dead. But here is his crowning glory, his crowning miracle. He's going to resurrect somebody that was already certified dead by the authorities, by the Pharisees, by the temple. He's dead, dead. So much dead that the, 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 the sister said, huh, going to roll away the stone? He's going to be stinking, you know, because he's been dead four days. But the more stinking and the more, the longer it is, the more glorious would the miracle be. And Jesus shouted and called, Lazarus, come forth. And he did come forth. Just like this allegory. Somebody by the name of Lazarus now came forth as a witness that Jesus is the truth, the resurrection and the life. And what did those rulers, the Pharisees, and those rich people do. They wanted to kill Jesus. And they wanted to kill Lazarus, in fact, because having him alive was like a pain. It's a reminder that Jesus is the Christ. And they didn't like that. So Jesus was teaching them and warning them ahead of time that, you know, 
if you don't listen to Moses and the prophets, even if Lazarus would come back to life and tell your brothers, they won't be. not listen. And that came true in a slightly different way, but you learn to see the parallel that is much there that tells us they didn't listen because they wanted to kill Jesus and that's not what Moses taught them to do, right? Moses said, thou shall not kill in the, I mean, it was written in the Ten Commandments and Moses upheld that. So this is the reason why Jesus gave this allegory, to warn them and to let them ponder and to teach us not about hell, but how we have to be kind to the poor. We have to realize that we have to listen to Moses and the prophets, including all these Pharisees. Oh, uh, uh, Sister Rosanna, I just want to add uh, about the, this, uh, you know, about the raising of data. Uh, sometimes we call it uh, translation. If it is a live person, uh, a live uh, body, uh, translation up or assumption, you know, of the of the living up, like, uh, you know, uh, character, uh, characters uh, like uh, Enoch, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in what, what, who is Elijah? So do they go to heaven directly? So that, in other words, uh, they didn't have to go through the process of judgment day and so on and so yeah. forth that we have described just now? Yeah. So there are some special people in which they didn't have to go through the judgment day because they have already been found righteous. Okay? He not walked with God and he was not, but God took him. And so God took him to heaven and um, we have Elijah also translated. Mm -hmm. And those are the two men that represents those mentioned in First Thessalonians 4, 15 to 17. The alive, those who are alive and remain will be caught up. Whereas um, we know that Moses died and he was resurrected. He's in heaven, but he is an exception. He's supposed to go into the promised land. How do we know he is resurrected? Because in Jude 7, we are told that the devil contended with his, with his body, uh, for his body. And Michael the archangel said, the Lord rebuke me. And so we know that Moses was taken to heaven instead of going into the promised land Canaan at that time because of his sin. God gave him something better in, in what you call uh, in knowing that Jesus is going to die and he will be together with Noah, I mean, with, with Enoch and Elijah, they all are sinners, but through the merits and righteousness of Christ, they will be in heaven. And so Moses represents those who die and will be resurrected in the last days because we saw Moses at the Mount of Transfiguration. Right? Yeah, and Moses, yeah. as well as Elijah, Two, one who has died and resurrected, one who never died and was translated. Okay, that that's a very good uh, explanation, uh, Sister Rosanna, and I really appreciate that. Uh, but one thing uh, I will just just immediately <laughs> now cross my mind on that, you know, why is it that these things happen in the first and the Old Testament, you know, the New Testament uh, we don't after Jesus. Uh, Let's say present times, you know, I'm sure there are good people who also deserve to be translated direct to heaven. But we don't hear anything about this, uh, you know. Is any such incident like that which happened after, you know, a crucifixion of Jesus and all that? Okay, all these characters that you mentioned are all in the Old Testament. But what about the, after that, the New Testament and forward until the current time? Do I, I don't hear any stories of miracles like that happening, you know. What is really happening, you know, in, in, I, I really do not know. Okay, I mean, I'm not, not saying have people uh, translated because maybe maybe Jesus doesn't want us to, to think of the rapture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I want to show you something that was miraculous, and that is in Matthew 27, verse 52. That is after Jesus died, and the temple veil was torn from top to bottom and the bible tells us in matthew 27 52 and the graves were open 
and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. So they may not be translated from living, but there are some of these saints, okay, which arose. And verse 53 tells us, and they came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many. So this is quite a miraculous situation which we don't hear very much about except what is written here. Say something. <clears throat> just, okay. Just, just, yeah, just I want to say something, uh, Rosanna. Yes, Dr. Yeah, regarding the question of our brother King Singh, he, he said, is there a hell or, or heaven, right? Something like that. Right? What is his main main question just now? Huh? Alan, what is your main question? Is there a hell? Well, my main question is, that, is there actually a physical hell, you know, when, uh, you know, I was quoting the story of uh, Lazarus and the rich man, you know. So now I understand that it is just a parable or, you know, or, or you, you know, it's just a fiction, you know. Mm -hmm. I will keep my view. I will yeah. keep my view. Uh, yeah. We are not uh, confronting each other. The view on, you see, the secret thing in Deuteronomy say that there are certain questions that you ask. I just say in, uh, in scripture. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 39 say, the secret thing belongs to the Lord. Huh? The secret thing. You want me to read? I read for you, huh, King Zeng. Uh, yeah. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse uh, 29. I read to you in the in the, this uh, okay. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. And the Lord there is L-O-R-D. Uh, that means it's a, a three in one. Uh. <laughs> I say uh, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. In the oh, Genesis, the Trinity. Say, let us make triune, the triune, I, I yeah. emphasis as well. You see, uh, the secret thing belongs unto the Lord our God. But Spirit, those yeah. things, uh, when this, those things is very question mark already. Yeah, I just say, but those things which are reviews belong unto us and to our children forever. Mm -hmm. And we are the children, you see. And we may not, we may do all the words of this law. I stop here. Then there are testimony. There are testimony that they have went to the hell. Jesus saw them. They say they use the word danger. There are many testimony that people uh, in India in there, they say, I went to the hell. Jesus told me this and my mansion and all these things. There are many. And then heavenly men. These are their testimony. These are their testimony. And then according to this rich man and Rajaras, but this is in the Bible. Then how to interpret it? That's why. Just now our brother say. Why is it so, so short? The distance, just a tip of water. But in, in Abraham say there is a vast a gap separate between. So if we do use our natural mind to understand it, I surrender. I better, I better, I better that to it's say that there is heaven and hell. But you ask yeah, me to describe yeah, yeah. hell, I think hell is a very hot place mm. because it is deep. Uh, that is my <laughs> view. That's my view, my brother. So you can compare it yeah. and you can ask the Lord. You see? Uh, That's yeah. why to put it in the perspective of how we describe it today, okay? All right. So there is a heaven, right? When Jesus comes, the righteous, either if they're dead, they're resurrected and living, they're caught up and they're with Christ forevermore starting for a thousand years in heaven. So there is a heaven, right? There is mm -hmm. a heaven. Yeah. Now, the question then is, when is hellfire? Yes, hellfire for those covetous Pharisees that Jesus was addressing will occur when they are resurrected at the end of time. And the gulf is wide. It's more than a thousand years. Right? Jesus comes. Right? The righteous are resurrected. And 
the others, the wicked, are not resurrected until a thousand years later, and then second death. So it's more than a thousand years between heaven and hell. And hell is uncomfortable, depending on your wickedness. For, for those Pharisees, they will be there, burning for longer than most people. <laughs> okay? Because they had the privilege of the Son of God, such great light in their midst, and they cannot see the light. Mm. They so, killed him. So heaven and hell does not need to occur at the same time. It can be far apart for a thousand years, but there is heaven and there is hell. Because there are two resurrections of the righteous and the wicked divided by a thousand years. But yeah. hell is not ever burning. Right? But the wicked will be burned longer. I mean, Hitler will burn much longer than his soldiers. <laughs> okay. Right? So, in that burning, they will suffer and they will feel like that rich man. Give me some water. So, we got to fit, we can fit that question into what we have said. And it's still true. What we've said is still true. And it's still comfortable and delightful and relieving. <laughs> and we can still smile. The <laughs> Goto. You see, the Bible say, the Bible say, hell, there are so many words. One is called hell. One is called shul, S-H-E-O-U-L. And one also called Gehana, right? And then in the Bible, you see, in Hebrew, say, man appointed once to die. After die is judgment, right? Uh, uh, yeah, but it doesn't and, stay. And then also... It and also, just, just or, or I sum up this question, just uh, need, your, need your clarification or need your explanation, is it? And then in the book, uh, in the book of uh, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7 say, uh, we come from the dust. Huh? After that, we die. The body go to the, to the ground. After that, the spirit will go back to the Lord, to the giver, to the giver. Huh? Who is the giver? God is the one who gives. So may I ask all these three questions? Can you sum up or give some clarification? What I do you mean? Even, I'll see. do even better. I'll do even yeah. better. Ah, okay. Uh, the next After, talk, let's, say, let's say, let's say I ask in Hebrew, in Hebrew, chapter 9, verse 20, man appointed once to die. After die is judgment. Okay. So when they die, where do they go in the first place? It, it doesn't say immediately the judgment. It doesn't say that. You are in the tomb. Yes, it says you're in the tomb. It doesn't say immediately. Let's go to that text. All right? It, it actually yeah, it says, didn't say immediately, correct? It didn't say. It didn't say, correct? Matthew, uh, this Hebrew say nine. 27 say he didn't say immediately. Yes, he doesn't say immediately. Nine twenty-seven, right? Yeah, after this adjustment. Yeah. Can we read? Okay, I'll read. And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Okay. Um There is another text, I wish I can remember, where it says uh, that we die uh, in our order. In other words, we don't all die at different times. But then we await the judgment. You see? I, I can't, I'm sorry, but I, I wish I could get my. It's yeah. okay. I, I, it's okay. We, we, we can continue on the, this one. We can judge down. That I also believe, I also have heard that the order, you, you put the order, that is the sequence. Everybody has the timing, different timing of, of getting into uh, a pass away. Yeah, the rest, that's one. But I will try to check that verse also. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let other have the chance to ask. Um, yeah, actually, what Kokto was trying to say is we can do one whole session on this to address some of these questions because um, today is health and of course there will be some subjects related to it that uh, constantly come up. So uh, we will see the other questions now, shall we? Yeah. Okay, we have from Thomas Woon. Will all Christians be raptured? Will any lukewarm Christian be able to be alive when left behind? Uh, Pre-trip, post-trip, we will deal with it later. <laughs> big, big discussion. Okay, make sure you're there for that um, session. Yep. What happens during the millennium? Okay. All right. uh, millennium, we've touched a bit already, so we can elaborate a bit. Right? What happens during the millennium? So the picture, maybe you can get back to that slide, honey. Uh, the complicated one with the green arrow. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. This one. Uh, let's let's study it a bit. Okay. The green arrow is when Christ returns, and we know that when He returns at the last trump. The righteous dead are resurrected, and then the righteous living are caught up to spend forever. But it begins in the millennium, right? Because right after the green arrow is the millennium. Okay, and millennium, uh, it's on number four. Those verses tell you they all die. But Revelation 25, which is the purple one, also tells you. That the dead, the wicked dead, remain dead for a thousand years, which is the millennium. So, the earth is desolate, and Satan is likened to be chained up. So, for a thousand years, nothing happens on earth, whilst the righteous are up in heaven. So, to answer your question, the earth in the millennium is dead. Now, it touches a very uh, a, a sensitive point in the Christian mind now, doesn't it? Because we think, oh, the third temple, the reign of Christ over Israel is on earth during the millennium. So it's a very sensitive truth. And that's why we, when we talked yesterday about the future of Israel, we said, what did we say? We said, there's no Jew, neither Jew nor Greek. At the point of A, whether you are Jew or Greek, you have to be righteous to get up to heaven. And if even if you are Israel, right, you will be affected by those four wars at point number four. And if you are Israel or Israelite and you haven't accepted Christ by that green arrow. Or if you're lukewarm. Yeah, if you haven't accepted Christ. Or lukewarm. If you're lukewarm, you're going to be spat out, right? Mm -hmm. Then you, you die when he comes because his glory, is, the response in the Bible is fall on earth. Let us hide in the den. Let the mountains fall. It's better if the mountain fall on us than we, had, we, can, than we see the face of Jesus. So the earth is dead. So the point is, Neither Jew nor Greek says there is no one in the millennium. So it's impossible for a third temple for a Israel to be reigned by Christ. Because Christ is with the righteous up at number three in heaven. So now, the, this is a more mm -hmm. sensitive point for us to discuss. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh 
the indigestion must include this point. <laughs> okay. Uh, brother, brother Cock, uh, Cockto, yeah. my, Thomas Woon is my husband. I'm Gloria Woon. Okay. So he was the one who asked the question. Actually, he wanted to know uh, what will the righteous do in heaven during the millennium? Ah. Will they be like floating around like angels and playing the harp and the lion and all that? You know? What well, exactly will, I, will there I be any be rebuilding very, going on? I would be in the uh, fix because I'm not musical. So. <laughs> <laughs> we will have to learn from very beginning. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, here, here is where you need some um, uh, 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 holy imagination, <laughs> okay? Now, one of the things that will happen when you get up there will be, uh, yes. where is, if you're up there, uh, where is my pastor? He doesn't seem to be around. <laughs> I thought he was a good guy, mm -hmm. all right? Or, or you all are up there, all 34 of you. And you said, how come Cocteau is not here? I thought he was a good guy. <laughs> so there'll be a lot of questions. What happens if someone you hate and despise was up there? <laughs> Big question. And so because of the multitudes that are up there from different ages, there will be so much discussion and review of why, who is up here and who is not. And if your loved one is not up there, it is God who will wipe the tear from your eyes. And the books will be open. Now, every idle thought, every act is recorded. That's what the Bible says. Now, it sounds like a frightening thing, right? Every idle thought, every, everything that we do. Now, but let me tell you a story from a good friend of mine, a psychiatrist. When he was a student doctor at a hospital, there was a helicopter crash, a tourist helicopter crash. And among them was a black woman, a Jehovah's Witness. And the crash was bad. And the white folks and the uh, uh, black uh, Jehovah's Witness they all needed blood transfusion. But the Jehovah's Witness refused blood transfusion. And the, the hospital in which they were transported to put a nurse with a book to record everything that the doctors, the nurses, even my friend who was a student, doctor at that time, in conversation with this black lady, they pleaded with her, take transfusion or you will die. And she, her response was recorded to and fro, to and fro. And the book was open to record everything. Why? Because if she should die and the black folks came, the family came and said, you save all the white people and you let my mother, my sister die. It's racism. And then the hospital would open the book. And it is a book that records everything about the woman, how hard the hospital tried. Now, it is not us only who are under judgment. It is God who is also under judgment. Because how often do we say, God is like this, God is cruel. How can they flood the whole world? But God is under judgment that he did well to judge everyone justly. So these are the books in heaven. They record everything in case God is judged. And there will be people in heaven that will judge God because they have initially misunderstood him. And God will open the books to defend himself. Not just to show that the wicked is wicked but the just is just and that he is just okay. so there will be much in heaven to resolve to the satisfaction of all who are there that we will 
every <laughs> every knee will bow and every lip will confess that he is just. The other question I have is regarding hmm. the chart, the number four, uh, the, the, the chart that has a number four on it and it says that the wicked will be perished. So mm -hmm. that one with the, with the four scriptures over there, does that mean that those scriptures are referring to the wicked? Yes. Not to the righteous at all. Because the wicked will probably not know these scriptures. They will not be reading it. And how would it apply to them? Oh, okay. All right. Now, uh, we've got to go to another chart, which is not here. Okay, I'll describe it. We are all now here. We are all going to a time called the Great Tribulation. Right? We studied that. And a Great Tribulation means it's the greatest tribulation of all. And the tribulation always means where the wicked persecute the good. Now, it's not God giving tribulation yes. to the righteous. Yes. It's the wicked people giving tribulation to the good. And yeah. at the time of the end, the wicked are united, church and state. They have 666 as a mark of worship. They mandate it. They force it upon the righteous. And the righteous know that 666 from the Bible is not of God. Mm -hmm. Because we have explained this. 666 is a mandated day of worship. Mm -hmm. Any mandated false day of worship is bad. But it happens conveniently to be a mandated Sunday because Sunday is so convenient. All right, so it's a enforced Sunday. Now the righteous know it's a free will Sabbath. That points to God, the creator. God. So there is a conflict. Right? Now, in that conflict, there are only two groups. 666, that group, which is massive worldwide. New world order in the name of God to protect the whole of humanity and to preserve it. If you're not with us, you cannot buy and sell. Now, Everyone will be talking about those guys who are not accepting, accepting the mandate. Now, the situation is calamity, more pestilences, earthquakes, maybe, maybe economy goes down, economic collapse, right? Governments lose power. There are riots, the looting. Did you see the fire in Colorado mm. recently? My goodness. Every, virtually, <coughs> every house in the path of that fire was burned up. Amazing stuff. Anyway, with greater calamities, government lose power and religious power comes to fill the power. Now, the other guy, this, the, the whole thing is desperation. Let's come back all to God. But, and get back to prosperity and safety and a normal life. But those crazy guys are, are refusing to come with us. We're just coming back to prosperity, to what we love. But they say our mandate, our a day of worship is wrong. <laughs> it should be the Sabbath. And because of them, we can't get back to prosperity and normalcy. So the blame is on those guys. Just like today, in the COVID thing, who is blamed for more and more COVID? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right? You gotta blame someone. And that is going to be the situation. The righteous are blamed. And because the four winds are let go, uh, the winds of strife, they are worse and things get worse. Desperation get worse. The more the blame is. So we got a mandate now. If you guys don't come back, come over to us. You, you, you're not part of us. You can't buy and sell. You can't be part of our economy. 
when it is restored, when there's prosperity, we freeze your bank account. You can't buy yourself. And that's the death decree when it gets worse and desperate. So when those guys are persecuted, the righteous, everybody will be talking about them as everybody's talking about the unvaccinated now. <laughs> right? They have to play. They are losing their jobs. They're crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm not for vaccination or, un, or not vaccinated. I, I am neutral to it. I, I accept that there are good vaccines. Right? I, I'm just learning from this situation how the herd will feed on the minority. So this will exacerbate it. But the minority are, are very uh, spiritual. They are loving. They hold the Bible. They tell everybody this is not of God and they can prove it. And because they stand and yield their lives in love for the other, the whole world will take note. They will be so inquisitive. Who? What do they believe? Why are they like that? So they stand for God. Their love shines for God. And YouTube will feature them. TikTok will talk about them. <laughs> you will be WhatsApping them, right? And they will be a witness for God. As never before. A kind of people that has never been seen, never been witnessed. And the Bible says, here are they that keep the commandments of God. They have no guile in their mouth. They have the faith of Jesus. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So the witness is so great that if people who are witnessing this are not moved by their love and their strength, for the love of the enemy in Babylon who are persecuting, they are telling the enemy, come out, come out with their lives. If anyone is not moved and stays in Babylon and accepts that mark, they deserve that mark. Okay. That is how it will end. That is how the righteous are separated from the wicked. It's the judgment of the living. Two groups, either 666 or no 666, just like the time of the ark. Now, the time of the ark, Noah was building it for 120 years. And before that, Enoch had named his son Methuselah, which means that if he dies, the flood will come. That's a warning. His name was a warning, Methuselah. And when he died, 900 plus years later, almost a thousand years. So he was a witness to the people of their wickedness for a thousand years before he died. A witness. And Noah witnessed to the people with his effort in building the ark. And people were not moved. So did they deserve to be flooded? Yes. It is the same at the time of the end with 666. The ark is the 144,000 people. They are the initial group. But the Bible says many will join. Many will heed because of their, not just that those words like three messages, blah, blah, blah. It's how they give the, the message with their life. For they love not their lives unto the death. So we need that group of people. That's why we need to study. Now, the gospel has made you Christians, has made us Christians, right? That message at the end, what is it called? It's called the everlasting gospel. Revelation 14. We must study Revelation 14, the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel will make us 144,000. It comes into our life. It changes us. It gives us courage. It fills us with love and love casts out fear. 
and we proclaim it because we has benefited us. We proclaim it because it has done us good and we pass it on. We, we don't know prophecy. We don't know the 144,000. We don't know Revelations 14. There will not be that group. But God's prophecy will come true. When he prophesies, it will not come back void. Amen. So this is the call. This is why we're studying prophecy. Mm-hmm. Revelation 14. Actually, nothing more. Why? Is it so simple? It's all there. But there's the wine of Babylon. The stuff that we've been hammering into our eyes, our minds for a thousand over years that blocks us from understanding prophecy. That tells us prophecy is not important. Who says it so? Loudly, Rick Warren. Don't study prophecy because when it happens, you will know. This is what's happening. Oh, it's too difficult for you. And if you, your heart tells you you must study it and you Google it, there is so much wine of Babylon, so much rubbish, you can't even see what you should see. Who has made it complicated? The devil has made it complicated when it's so straightforward. Why is it difficult? Because we're trying to get through all that rubbish. It's like a, in a jungle with lots of tall grass around. If you cut through the tall grass before you can find the path. Why are we doing this? And, and we are, Roxana and I are so delighted when you say you are disturbed. <laughs> when you can't digest. Because you have listened to a lot of stuff that's blocking you. And why are we so delighted when you say, oh, you are suffering from indigestion, and we say, and you want to study more, we say, whoa, praise God. <laughs> and when you say it's very clear, and oh, wow, it really makes when, me so joyful. Yeah, when Kathy says the more she listens, the clearer it gets. Huh, Roxana and I, we are <laughs> celebrating at home, Okay. <laughs> Okay, we have um, a lot to celebrate about, but I think we have some questions here, Kokto. Would you like to take them? Um, I think we have a lot of people waiting also. Uh, Let's see, how shall we do it? Okay, Um, maybe we shall let Sally Tan, you have a question, Sally? No? I got, I got. Before I ask the question, can I read the Revelation 20, verse 10? Revelation 20, verse Verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cut into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Just now you mentioned that the hellfire is uh, some will be uh, the, 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 the timing uh, meaning but uh, what, uh, how do you explain this uh, 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 tormented they will be tormented day and night uh, forever and ever oh forever okay <laughs> all right you know sometimes we think of the word forever as really forever Okay, eternal life for all the righteous is forever, okay? But um, when it comes to the burning hell that is forever, we have to look at examples of how that word is being used in the Bible, okay? And so just now I mentioned in Jude, uh, actually I should say Jude 9 just now when they were uh, contending, the devil contending with, uh, let's all turn to Jude which has only one chapter, um, they were contending for the body of Moses. That's Jude 9. Now let's look at Jude 7. That means Jude chapter 1 verse 7. And let's see how the word eternal fire or forever and ever is being used here. Okay. It says here, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So God has given us uh, an example here where Sodom, we were told, was burned. 
And it tells here that it was an eternal fire. Now we are here on earth and do we see Sodom still burning today? Of course not, right? So what does this eternal fire as we, we, we saw in other verses just now, this fire will burn until everything has turned to ashes, okay? So it is not going to be forever because if you turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, it tells us what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. I read 2 Peter 2, 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow and so on. And this is an example for us, okay? Making them an example or an example unto those that after should live ungodly. So this is what will happen to those who live ungodly and they will be tormented forever and ever. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah, which will be turned into ashes in that so-called eternal fire, which will do its job. When the fire has done its job, finish, it's complete, it's perfect, done, over, forever. <laughs> it's more like destruction mm, is forever. Yeah. Mm. Now, uh, any more questions? Uh, because I, I had... I remember a response after we talked about hellfire. Uh, someone said, oh, if there's no hellfire, oh, it's such a relief. Uh, why do we need to go to heaven then? <laughs> <laughs> if hell is not that bad, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if hell is not that bad, right? Why go to heaven? Then people won't go to heaven, she said, right? No. They'll scare right. people to go to heaven by telling them that hell is going to be terrible. Okay. It is so, going to be terrible. Okay, no, but no, not no. forever. The, the important thing is this. We don't want to frighten people. It, it, to be driven by fear to get to heaven is a bad way of getting to heaven. We should get to heaven because we love God, because Amen. he's there, right? Now, I, I heard a, a teacher and this, I will say, this happened to be a Muslim teacher, and it was very wisely put. And it's a woman, and she said, "Lord, if I'm greedy for hell, no, sorry, I'm sorry. greedy for heaven. If I'm greedy for heaven. Keep me out of heaven. If I'm fearful of hell, throw me in hell. But if I love you, Lord, for who you really are." reveal yourself to me. Right? This is the motivation which we should have to get to heaven. It's not about driven by hell, by the fear of hell. Yeah? This is so important. Okay. Uh, let's have our next question here from the chat. I know um, Thomas Woon has been waiting for a long time for this question to be answered. Uh, Okay, the righteous are resurrected for rewards and not for punishment. So how is it that one who did not do the Father's will can be punished after resurrection? Didn't Jesus take the punishment of the righteous once and for all? Please help clarify. Uh, okay, I think what is being said here is the righteous are actually, I'm not very clear. The righteous are resurrected for rewards. Okay. Yes, the righteous will be resurrected for rewards. The punishment, uh, uh, so called, the, the sins of the righteous would have been confessed to Jesus and Jesus would take uh, their sins because Jesus died for it, right? Jesus took the punishment. So, okay. how is it? that the one who did not do the Father's will can be punished after resurrection. So if you did not do according to God's will, why are you punished? I think that's the question, right? Yes, that's the question because we were referring to your chart earlier where you mentioned about the one who knows the Father's will and didn't do it will be punished with, with more than the one who didn't know. 
something to the effect. Ah. Uh, so then we're thinking, if this is referring to the righteous, then didn't Jesus die for the sins of the, you know, the righteous are already safe, so they are safe to receive rewards and not to be judged again. Okay, just now that, that verses or chart that you were looking at, they refer to those who are not safe, not to the ones who are safe. So to the, the ones who are not safe, they will be punished also to speak uh, 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 destroyed in hell. And the destruction will depend on how wicked they have been. Like we said, if it's Hitler or Nero or oh, their... Uh, 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 the Satan will take the, the longest to, to, to burn in hell because um, they are like more stubborn, okay? So those who do not know and yet have to so-called be uh, burned in hell will be, will be punished with less stripes. But those who like, you should know already and yet you go away from the truth, they will be punished with more severe punishment. That's what it meant for this chart. Does it clarify it? I see. So it refers to those who are not saved. Correct. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. It does clarify. Okay. So am I right to conclude that hell does not exist yet? And, or maybe there is hell, but it is empty now. <laughs> what is hell? Okay. So hell is really not in existence now, but we can talk more about that when we um, deal more with the subject of um, what happens when people die and so forth. Okay, so uh, really, when will the burning start? The burning start after the millennium, when the wicked are resurrected, they didn't participate in the first resurrection, so they are not blessed. They will be resurrected at the second resurrection where they will then die again, the second death. And that burning hell, so to speak, will begin then. There's no hell right now. So we will have to deal with what, what, what are those people when they see, when they say they, 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 they die and they go to hell and they saw this and that and then they come back to life and talk about it. We will, we will deal with that at length and in one of um, maybe our next session. Okay. Thank you. All right. Welcome. Okay. Uh, Serena has, uh, Serene has a question. Okay, that starts here. So all the wicked who are alive at Christ's second coming will die the first death, then resurrected after 1,000 years and face judgment and second eternal death. Okay, I think we just answered that, right, Serene? And also the 100 years, is it prophetic years or literal years? 1,000 years. Oh, it's 1,000 years. Okay, 1,000 years, prophetic or literal years? Literal. Well, the Bible doesn't need uh, 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 such a long time anymore like the way it is on earth. Now, this is a heavenly thing already, which is like um, mystery solved more or less. Well, okay. if it's... If it's a thousand years. Uh, well, if long, it's long prophetic, time. it's going to be so long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's prophetic, okay? Let me uh, calculate. <laughs> with my calculator, how long that will be. Oh, dear. That will be really long. too long already. And, and actually, we don't need that length uh, to be so long, right? 1,000 is long enough yeah. for the people in heaven to find out why, in a way, they're judging, right? The Bible says, don't you know you will be judging angels? We will be judging during that 1,000 years. Like, why is so-and-so not here? And why will... Uh, why did Satan do what he did? No, we have to be clear in our minds before they get burned up. Once burned up huh, in the second death and hell, cannot <laughs> resurrect anymore already. <laughs> so we have to be clear in our minds that, okay, God is going to do really a just thing when he finally burns them after the millennium. So it's like no turning back after that. Everybody will be so clear in their minds that they will be praising God and say, the Lord is just and righteous. Praise be to the Lord. Okay, and then it will happen. All right, Thomas Woon, when does the judgment of the wicked take place? So we just said that it will be after the millennium. What do you mean by judgment throne? Okay, when it will be after the millennium? When... The great white throne, right? Yes, 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 the great white yeah. throne. But if you read uh, that great white throne, you will see that right after that, 
Okay, this is in Revelation 20. You can all turn to that. Yeah. There is uh, Revelation 20, 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Then verse 12 says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, this dead were the resurrected wicked dead. Now, the next verse tells you where they came, where they were resurrected from. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell. Or the grave, right? Up the dead which mm. were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So this is resurrection B. And the white throne was there, judging the wicked. Right? Or, if you like, their cases were reviewed in the thousand years. And then they were resurrected. And judgment is, I don't think they were just gathered and judged. They were judged before the white throne in the sense that they attacked the wicked, the the. the New Jerusalem, and fire came down. So that was the scenario of the great white throne judgment. Yeah, this... it's, it's the execution of a judgment because they were judged wicked already when yeah. Jesus came because yeah. they died. They were sentenced already. Yeah, this is the execution. Okay, in a court case, you have to, I don't know if you have lawyers here, but um, uh, I'm not a lawyer. So when you have a court case, when you're sentenced, <laughs> All right, you're judged guilty. There is still a period before you're executed. Okay, so um, the, the, the sentences have already been pronounced. Everybody, had the jury, the jury, who's the jury? The jury is actually, right now, I think those uh, up in heaven, they have already looked through the books. They have all decided, yes, God is just, this is correct. And so the execution will take place at this point, at the second death. In Revelation 20. So is it correct to say that the sentencing has been done at the point of their death? At the point oh. of the wicked oh. time? Well, it, sentencing or no, 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 not sentencing. The decision whether they are righteous or wicked was done already when Christ returns. Because the Bible says when he returns, he brings his reward with him. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right mm -hmm. for the righteous dead, the reward is the resurrection. For the righteous living, they are caught up. Mm -hmm. So yes. what happens when a person dies? The door is shut. Was it this group today? <laughs> we talk about the shut door, right? Yes. Um, did we talk about it in this group? I was I have so many groups. I forgot which group we talk about the shut door. No, <laughs> so, not this. Group. Not this group. Okay. All right. You know, just now we talk about Noah. Uh, no, not just now. This afternoon we talk about Noah. Okay, some of you were there. Um, we talk about the shut door happening in several instances of the mm -hmm. Bible. And so we have the story of Noah's Ark in which after Noah and the animals all went in, we are told in Genesis 7 that the door of the ark was shut by the Lord himself. Okay, mm -hmm. so when the door is shut, it's like, okay, this Genesis 7, 16, okay, the Lord shut him in. It's like also in Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels pulled Lot, no Lot went out, the angels pulled him in and they shut the door, right? So there is a shut door in which the wicked will be wicked still, the righteous will be righteous still. You cannot say, oh, shut door, uh, we don't know, right? Sometimes, uh, and, and, and so when the rain came, and then they saw that the rain came, and that's the prophecy now. Oh, Noah's prophecy is true. Now we want to go in. No, no, no. Let us in. Let us in. But the door cannot be opened really because it has been shut by God. Okay? And in the same way that Sodom and Gomorrah, the door was shut by the angel, shut closed. And another shut instance is 
at the uh, the five virgins who didn't have enough oil. They're Christians because they're waiting for God, right? For, waiting for the bridegroom to come, Jesus. And they went out to buy oil because they didn't have enough oil. They didn't like study the Bible enough. So now they went to buy oil, but it's too late because by the time they came in, the door was shut. So why am I talking about that? Because when a person dies, that door is also shut. Cannot be changed really. Whatever has they have decided during their lives, they can't change their minds anymore, even if they had died suddenly or whatever. It's like, it's over for them. Okay? But, but uh, more than that, right? Even at death, the door is shut. I mean, there's, either you're righteous or you're not. Okay? But in Revelation 22, tells us that there is a shutting even for when people are living. Mm, okay. Right? When we are living, the door can be shut. And that's the time of the great tribulation. It's when what you choose. You choose 666 or you don't. Okay, let's read this shut door. Or this uh, 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 no more <laughs> chance, let's say. Revelation 22.11 where grace does not work anymore. There's always grace because Jesus is grace. God is grace, all right? But the grace doesn't work. It's not applied anymore. Okay, let's read it in Revelation 22, 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And then the next verse is, And, and behold, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Okay, so there is a point in time when although God, uh, Jesus, continues to be who they are, gracious, but the work of grace is stopped. If you're filthy, you're filthy still. So it applies to the time of the end. It applies to 666 or worship God. Okay. So we have to know the time, the day of our visitation. You know, when God visits us, when we have the chance to know and search the Lord, we have to do it because we do not know when our life will end because when our life ends, we can't search for God anymore. So we have to um, seek him while he may be found. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay. Okay, I think there are no more questions. All right. Uh, well, I hope it's been useful, beneficial, uh, that we have seen uh, a perspective and the character of God that's so uh, edifying and in whom we can trust with our lives. Amen. Amen. Right. To those who have joined just now or one time, two time, I encourage you that wherever that uh, Sister Rosanna or Kofu, they have other place, go and join again and learn more time. Lyric, it will help you a lot. It will yeah. really help you a lot. Huh? I, I wish uh, I will help many more people because with this understanding, I can always compile. I have listened, but the truth is always the truth. Because uh, we don't want to be like Israel, stiff neck. <laughs> I use the word stiff neck. Uh, Hokkien say ban uh, We don't want. We, we want to be, yeah, just now, even though. Brother Koksu say, uh, the, this is my favorite, uh, uh, this one, uh, Revelation 22, 11. Let the righteous be righteous still. Let the holy be holy still. Let the uh, the filthy be filthy still. You know, what they want to do, they let them do. But it's a question, just now it's a question, it's either 666, that during that time, either you choose 666, you are in the city, or you, you want to be righteous still. You see, this is important. Huh? So now we are, we are still living, 
and you have the freedom of choice. Uh, I just conclude it, heaven and hell, which one you prefer? I just... <laughs> yes. Okay, so we will be starting a new group on the 8th of January, which is just this coming Saturday, where we will start from number one, the 70 weeks prophecy that we have done also in this group. So if you like and you uh, want to join us, please get my phone number. It's 9327-6151. I've just put it on the chat. So once again, I want to invite you all to invite others as well. Yes. Okay, because um, the time is short and the devil also knows his time is short. So we have to work faster, right. you know, than what we have right now. <laughs> That's why we are starting group after group and we are so thankful to Dr. Lim who has um, given us the opportunity to speak on this platform twice a week. <laughs> it's Thank really you. good. Okay, and um, those of you who have followed us like week after week, uh, I think you all also have been blessed even though you're hearing some things over and over again because it needs time to digest. It needs time to uh, gel in our minds so that we can see the picture because I know some of you, you come to this session, another day you'll be on another session of different picture and then you're all a little bit uh, very... Uh, confused <laughs> yes, yes, yes. so we want you all to stay with us and study so that you will not be confused okay right yes oh, that's why i told my group a asia interior mission group and the global uh global mission vision group i say you set the time uh, all together it's about 35 hours and then left for a few hours can ask for question uh, please set a good room, quiet, uh, silent, no distraction. Let your wife or children outside the room. I told them already, if I, this year, I'm going to do that for them. Uh, I told them. So I hope that when I, I already gather these people in one group, and these are all ministers of God, uh, uh, just, just I will take their name, each one of them, and, and I will present them a certificate. And I like eh, that you help to endorse, even though it's under Asia Interior Mission and also Gloom. I can put your husband and wife name and put uh, you are the facilitator and as well as the speaker that you yes, can. Yes. yes. Uh, hey, thank you very much. No, this is a kingdom business. It's not my business. It's a kingdom business. It's true. And I thank Victor Lee who introduced uh, to you and... Uh, and Victor Liu should also be given uh, a place okay, for this ministry. Amen. You know? Victor, yes, we told yeah. Victor it's been a milestone for us, for you to have invited us to this platform. And um, we are really, truly blessed to be here. And we really want to thank Victor and Dr. Lim for uh, having faith in what we are teaching and bringing us here. We have much to share and we ask that you all will come back again next Saturday night and Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. Uh, for those of you who want to revisit the first lesson, like I said just now, we have um, this one here. Oh, okay. I don't know whether you can see or not, but uh, we have our, I can't click that, huh? our so-called link, 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 right? You want the link, right? Yeah, we, we, uh, HNL, yeah. yeah HNL okay, link. you take down my phone number, then we talk, okay? So you yeah. can actually take down my phone number and I will give you the flyer. I'm trying to show you the flyer, but it's not my 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 platform right now. So um, you can see me today. Yeah. I, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Just now, the current, the car, my, my, my battery was down. No. Hey, you are still the host. Yeah, yeah I'm still the host, but you are the host uh, because I'm using your email. <laughs> okay, so it's that I'm you like that right now. Okay, never mind. Um, give me take, take down my phone number and I'll send you the e-flyer. And I really want you to pray for yourself, for your friends, or whoever you are going to invite. And pray for us too that we will reach more people and be able to present well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
Dato Lim and Brother Victor for having us here tonight. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray first before we close, okay? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure opening up your word, spending time looking at what your word has to tell us, makes us feel like you're talking to us. And I can almost feel your smile as you look at us studying your word. I can almost feel your, 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 the pleasure of heaven as we stay on each one of us these hours here, tasting you and see how good you are in the way you have rolled out the plan of salvation that we sinners may be saved that we sinners may have a hope, that we may have eternal life. Oh, what a blessing you have made possible for us. Let us, let us not keep it to ourselves, but let us take this blessing and share it and live it and study more as we commune with you. So may our spirit be with us in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody, may we all say hallelujah and yeah. praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. See you again. God bless. Please take my phone okay. number and we're going to have you on the new group if you choose to be. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Dr. Lim, speedy Bye-bye. recovery. Yes. Dr. Lim, get well. Thank you. Get well soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.